empezar. Welcome to the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce 2021 mayoral debate on Rogers TV. My name is Krista Ross. I'm CEO of the Fredericton Chamber. Thanks so much for tuning in to hear from the four candidates vying to be the mayor of our beautiful city. We thank those of you who submitted questions to us. Our team worked through them to choose 12 that were the most common themes and were important to you. Tonight's debate is also being taped and will be shared on our social media. Of course, I also want to give a big thank you to the candidates, not only for joining us here this evening, but for putting their names forward to serve our community. It's a big commitment, and we commend all mayoral and council candidates for putting themselves out there and asking citizens for the vote. Finally, a thank you to our moderator this evening, Gilles Alain, Executive Director of the Chalmers Foundation. Gilles and the Foundation are great partners of the Chamber, and we appreciate the continued support. Thank you, Krista, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Like Krista said, welcome to this Fredericton Chamber of Commerce mayoral debate. As you know, the municipal elections will be held on May 10th throughout the province. In Fredericton, we have four candidates running for the office of mayor. As Krista explained, the questions were submitted to the chamber. They vetted the questions and chose 12 to be asked tonight uh, from the podium. The candidates have not been privileged to those questions, so they will get them uh, at the same time. So the questions were sent to me uh, prior to the broadcast. The evening will be made up of four sections. Uh, the first section will be a four-minute opening statement by each candidate. The first round of questions will, be, will contain six questions at 90 seconds response for each candidate. The second round of questions, six questions again, one-minute responses, 60-second responses for each candidate. At the end, a two-minute closing statement by each candidate uh, will be made before we wrap up the evening. Now, in order to uh, present the candidates to you tonight, what we did is chose uh, candidates A, B, C, D for placement on, on the podium in the order to my left. Uh, and the first candidate to my left is Corinne Hersey. The second candidate, Drew Brown. The third candidate, Kate Rogers. And finally, Mike O'Brien. So the candidates that's how the order went, and we will stagger the questions from one candidate to the other as we go along. So without further ado, my first question is to Corinne. The opening statement. That is correct. Thank you, Drew. Quick on the ball. Opening statement. We begin with Corinne. Hi. My name is Corinne Hersey, and uh, I have been in Fredericton my whole life, uh, born in bred here and uh, grew up in Marysville. Um, I'm happy to be here with the Chamber of Commerce. I come from an entrepreneurial family, originally a working class family where my grandfather worked in the cotton mill. So um, having business in my blood, I suppose, it's odd for me to be an educator. And my dad used to say, when are you going to get a job? even after I'd been teaching like 10 years. But anyway, um, I decided that. Uh, to, when I looked around with the city of Fredericton, and it's such a beautiful city, but I saw things that I felt, for me, were going in the wrong direction. And so I wondered what I, if I had the skills to be able to make an impact. And I knew that from my education and the work that I had done, I've always worked at the grassroots level, um, right inside of the community. And of course, in sociology, I'm always researching and studying and teaching deviance and housing and poverty, uh, food advocacy, and issues that are at the community level. And I get my students to volunteer. So I'm very involved in that grassroots. And that is what I thought that I could actually bring to City Hall. People have asked, well, why didn't you run for council? Why did you go for the mayor's seat? And at the time, I thought um, I needed to just start at the mayor's seat. I needed to change the vision because it was the imagined Fredericton plan that I saw as real, really problematic to the city. 
Not that we don't need housing, not that we don't need development, but I just saw things that were going in the wrong direction. And then Officer Square really kind of put me to the edge and I thought I had to make that decision to run. Uh, I'm very glad that I have. Over the past year, I've seen further things, of course, COVID complicating some things, but funding going into different areas. And so uh, those, again, are things that I find very problematic because the funding's not going to the bottom level uh, where we need housing and um, that hits the people on the ground where they are. So I'm happy to be here. I'm anxious to hear all of the platforms and uh, further conversation from the other candidates. And I feel that um, it is something that is so important to the city to be able to bring the, the um, grassroots experience that I have and also the education that I have in working in a community like this. And I love Fredericton so much, as we all do, that we want the best for Fredericton, we want the best for our children and the next generations, we want a healthy city, uh, we want a city where businesses can thrive and there's no roadblocks uh, thrown up in their way, and that there's equity and inclusion um, and people just feel happy to come here and this is what they want to do. So thank you for inviting me, and I do hope that um, this is an inspiring night, that we all have great things to say, and uh, I look forward to the, the questions that will come our way. Thank you, Corinne. Now over to Drew for opening statement. Thank you, Gilles. Uh, I would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce for setting this up. Thank you for doing your part to help with the democratic process in Fredericton. Um, before I begin, I would like to call upon the Hague government to call a public inquiry into the circumstances surrounding Lexi Dakin's death. Lexi was a cub of mine, and I was her Akela. I always told her to do her best. It is now time for us to do our best and to fix a broken system. My name is Drew Brown, and I have lived in Fredericton for 28 years. A forester by training and trade, whose working career has been uh, diverse and varied. One constant in my working career has been to produce something by the end of the day. Like many New Brunswickers, my pay depended on getting work done, be it gathering data, planting trees, piling lumber, transporting people, selling shoes, or help plumbing out a new bathroom. I believe that action of any kind will produce change for the better. I am the only candidate to prepare to lead a city crew of summer students dedicated to improving our downtown. The downtown crew will plant trees, clean the sidewalks, and do whatever necessary to beautify and enhance our downtown. I am an independent worker who can get things done on my own and then seek out others to complete the job or project if necessary. I will bring the same approach to the mayorship. I will do what I can get done and expect the same of others. I believe that this approach will produce the tangible results the city needs to move forward. Now many of you are wondering how will I pay for my promises. Here is my view on Fredericton's current financial position. Fredericton is in the enviable position of having had many years of prudent fiscal management. Of course, the average New Brunswicker is an expert on surviving on next to nothing, so it would only make sense that our city has done an excellent job on keeping operating costs low. Currently, Fredericton has a debt service ratio of 3% on an annual operating budget of $125.1 million. By provincial law, the city is permitted to carry a debt service ratio of 25% or $31.3 million annually. Clearly, the city has room to borrow if necessary. The city also stands to benefit from rising real estate prices. On the City of Fredericton property tax calculator, the price of an average house has increased in value by 9.9%. Clearly, the city's revenue is going to grow over the next four years. How much depends upon the provincial government, but if assessments rise by 9.9%, the city's share would be 7.92%. 87% of the city's operating budget comes from property taxes. 
This should mean that the city will see an increase of $8.5 million year after year in the operating budget for the next four years for a total of $34 million. If $6.5 million per year were allocated to housing, heritage and homelessness, it would mean that without borrowing any money, the city would have $26 million to spend. The money could also be used to borrow more money to build or be spent on new initiatives. In conclusion, the city has or will have the money and the available credit to do a lot of things it has to take action. Thank you. Opening statement. I'm Kate Rogers and I want to be your mayor. I have been city councillor for Ward 11 for the past nine years and I've been actively engaged in my council work, chairing and participating in various standing committees and advisory committees and various boards and commissions. I was deputy mayor from 2016 to 2018. I'm known for speaking up for my constituents and raising issues that I know are important to Fredericton residents. I was born and raised in Fredericton. My roots run deep from South Devon where my grandfather and his brothers built their businesses to Rabbit Town in the Lower Hill my, where my parents raised our family. And it was while working in my family's residential property business that I developed a strong work ethic, learned the value of a dollar and was taught to be kind to everyone and most of all to serve the community that supports us. I have tried to live my life in pursuit of these values. When my husband and I were deciding where to build our lives, we chose Fredericton. I love the arts and the outdoors, and my husband loves mountain biking and live music. We wanted to raise our two daughters in a supportive, safe community that was affordable, with lots of amenities, and in a home where we could walk to work, parks, and the grocery store. I have a master's degree in political science from UMB, and I've built my career in nonprofit administration, community development, policy research, and advocacy. I've led various organizations with a focus on helping people and bringing about positive change, most recently as the executive director of the Fredericton Community Foundation, where this past year alone, I oversaw a grant making of over a million dollars to community groups hardest hit by the pandemic. In these positions and in my work as an active community volunteer, I've acquired to lead through building relationships, collaborating and setting sights on a common goal. Fredericton is a growing city. We're growing by about 1,500 people per year, and I believe that Fredericton's growth must be matched by our ability to care for people, house people, nurture our environment, and support the businesses that drive our economy. I know that by working together, we can create a city that's more vibrant, affordable, and healthy. But to fulfill that vision, we need active leadership. Much of what needs to be accomplished requires collaboration with other levels of government. But we can't wait on our provincial and federal partners and then complain when they don't act. We must convey to them what is important to Fredericktonians. We must speak up. And when we don't see progress on issues of concern and need for our city and its residents, we must make that clear. I love my city. It's beautiful. And I have a wonderful life but not everyone here does. We need to be intent on creating a city that works for everyone. I also love my city work, but I'm frustrated that we're not getting across the finish line on big projects that will attract people to our city and enhance the lives of residents, or that we're not finding resolutions to some large issues that I know are of grave concern to Fredericktonians. I'm frustrated that city governance, council and its standing committees aren't representative of the diversity in our city, that more hasn't been done to be inclusive and bring diverse perspectives to decision making. We can no longer be exclusive, passive or reactive. We must get out in front of issues, be proactive, be intentional in what we want for our city and make it happen. I'm a leader who can bring this approach to the city. I have a track record and the necessary experience to get to work and do the job. I won't say we can't do something because it's not our responsibility. Rather, I will say I know it's important to Fredericktonians and we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to get it done, whether that be by reaching across the table or by setting the table. Thank you, Kate. Final opening statement, Mike. Thank you. Five years ago, Fredericton put their, Fredericktonians put their faith in my vision and leadership for our city, and together we have achieved so much. We've maintained the lowest municipal property tax rate of all New Brunswick cities. We found millions in operational efficiencies without reducing any services. 
We have set a record development and remarkable job and population growth. And we've become a national leader in climate change adaptation and protecting our environment. And we've risen as an exciting and culturally rich city and a city with a big heart. I am proud of all these accomplishments. Ladies and gentlemen, I wear my love for Fredericton on my sleeve. I was raised here, Anne and I raised our four daughters here. Community involvement is my passion, as is serving you at City Hall. 15 years as a proud Northside councillor, and the last five as your mayor. My engineering career trained me well, and I was excited to bring this expertise to the mayor's job. When I see a problem, we fix it. And when I see an opportunity, we grab it. I previously mentioned some of the accomplishments we've achieved. Now, let me add some detail. In my term, 543 million in development has occurred. The lion's share is by private sector investment. When the private sector shows this much confidence in our city and invest in create jobs, you know you're on the right track. A focus on startup business development helped create about 250 startup companies and 1,900 related jobs. During, the, during this time, Fredericton's population grew by 7,800 people. Tourism set economic activity records each year, including a record 343 million in 2018. And we've been selected by the Canadian Federation of Municipalities as one of Canada's showcase cities for our work on climate adaptation. And working with all our partners, we have so far been so extremely successful in protecting our city and residents from this COVID pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, these are but some of the examples of, my, of our collective success and my vision and leadership I bring to the table and to City Hall every single day. As for my platform, it's our visionary 25-year growth strategy. We adopted this three years ago, and it already is paying dividends, as evidenced by the statistics that I presented. There's no need to head off in some new intangible style or costly direction. We listened to the public, say what they wanted their city to be like, we spoke to the experts, and then we developed this strategy. It is visionary, and it's working. Staying focused on it will be ev make us more even fiscally and environmentally sustainable, will create more complete and walkable communities, We'll focus on growing our population, increasing immigration, growing jobs and supporting our businesses, and much, much more. But there's always more to do. I will always be laser focused on keeping our tax rate flat and to support our residents, families, our seniors, our business sector, and to stimulate growth. In 2011, as Chair of Finance, I brought in the first tax rate reduction in a generation. I'm commit that we can do that again if the conditions are right. As the engineer mayor, I've led many of our climate change and energy reduction initiatives and will continue to do so. We just released our community energy plan with the goal of reducing emissions by 80% over base year. I know this city, I know we can hit that target, and I know we can hit it out of the park. I've reached out to the Department of Health and Social Development to discuss a partnership to develop Fredericton-centric mental health strategy with a focus on addressing the mental health and addiction issues of, uh, that are for our street homeless. These are our residents, and a compassionate solution is desperately needed. This is what leaders do. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you'll no doubt hear about a need for a change, a new leadership and collaboration. I submit that my leadership, vision, and experience and collaboration skills are exactly what is needed to recover from the pandemic, to expand on our great successes, and to tackle our greatest challenges. On May 10th, I respectfully ask for your vote to finish our job. Thank you to the four candidates for those opening statements and especially thank you for coming in under that four minute mark. Uh, respectfully appreciated from the podium. Uh, segment two, uh, this is where we go into six questions uh, that we will present to you. Uh, and for each uh, question, uh, when it's your turn, you have 90 seconds uh, to provide your answer. We will begin with Corinne, followed by Drew, Kate and Mike. The first question, what are your top three priorities for Fredericton over the next four years? Um, my top three priorities, I would say, are very short term and then long term, so not necessarily four years, but I do believe that the people, everyone I've talked to at the door, their concerns are accountability and transparency, that they don't trust City Hall anymore. So I'd want to build trust. Um, then I would certainly want to, also everybody has said they're very frustrated with Officer Square and um, not knowing what's going on at the NBX grounds. So I would halt what is going on there and see what, what is happening, what contracts have been signed, um, what we can do to put that space and make it the beautiful green space that it was. 
And the other priority, of course, that I hear every door I go to is housing, affordable housing and homelessness. I believe with the homelessness, um, I've talked and worked with people at the shelters and uh, also with organizations that are connected with them. And the one thing they say is that City Hall often blocks what they do, uh, that they don't have the funding they need, that they need to um, just do their jobs. And I think that's what, what can happen there. And with housing, of course, development has to be inclusive. It has to include housing for uh, seniors, for students, and intergenerational type that is affordable and what people can know is predictable. True. Well, uh, my campaign is housing, homelessness, and heritage. And in the housing department, I think it's very important that the city take an active role. I believe the city should look at becoming a property owner and buying property for the purpose of it being turned into housing. Now, they do own property in the Fredericton Exhibition Grounds. They own property in other places in the city. Um, and I think this would give them the ability to provide that diversity of housing if it's not being provided by the private sector. They also could use that ability to partner with development uh, developers to develop the housing we're needing. Um, in the homelessness situation, I think some of it is we should look at the immediate. Um, we're coming up to a warmer season. We're probably going to have some pressure for a tent city to arise. So I think we have to be ready for that, um, try to work uh, some strategy that's going to allow us to get some stability for the homeless people. And as Mike mentioned, there's a lot of issues there. And uh, what we want to try and do is get some stability in these people's lives, get them the help. And then I feel by the winter, we should be looking and trying to get them in a, a place where they have a house, or not a house, but a, a roof over their head and is somewhere warm. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Drew, for that response. Kate, over to you. Uh, my three priorities, uh, would, first would be housing. I think the greatest pressure in our city right now is housing ac across the entire continuum. And there are various ways that that needs to be addressed. I'm in support of having a housing specialist at the city at City Hall to advise us on how to move forward in all in various different areas. We have acute homelessness, and with acute homelessness, we need to support the nonprofit organizations and community groups that are doing the work. Through uh, we have a low vacancy rate, which means that there that uh, people are very precariously housed in apartments, and we need to be inciting more development and the right types of development, inclusive development of all different housing types. And we need to be encouraging uh, a development of, of various housing stock, whether that be single family de dwellings or, or duplexes or, or cooperative housing. So housing is the number one pressure point. Number two, I would like to see us finish some of these projects to create vibrancy in our city and create healthy, healthy active lifestyles with the Performing Arts Centre and the Regional Aquatic Centre. I also want to see us finish Officer Square and I'm all for, I think we go back to the basics with Officer Square and we, we respect the cultural, indigenous and, and cultural historic significance, we, the natural beauty, replace the trees, and, and, and finally I, I'm concerned with growth and I think we have to make sure that we're attracting but then also supporting people once they get here through business supports, through social cohesion, that we're creating a very inclusive community in our city so that people want to live and stay. Thank you, Kate. Over to you, Mike, uh, the final candidate for your Thank answer. You. In, uh, in no particular order, fiscal stability. Uh, we have to stay fiscally responsible and uh, on top of that file at all times. It's, what, it's what's made us successful. We've put long-term fiscal plans together, we put long-term asset management plans together, and that is what's made us robust and resilient. And if we get off track from that, just like you would do at your home or in your business, we'll lose our way. There's a lot of candidates that are trying to uh, run on a lot of different platforms that could really test our, uh, our purse. And we have to be very cognizant of uh, staying the course on our great plans that have, that have made us renowned across Canada. Social issues. We have to get better at addressing social issues. Um, that has been the, um, uh, along with climate change, uh, that we have to adapt to. Social issues in our community are the biggest thing that have impacted uh, our businesses downtown. Our residents want this addressed. 
Uh, traditionally, honestly, this is not our file, but we can't say that anymore. It's been, uh, people want this solved. So we've got to work on it and we've got to find partnerships with the province to solve really the mental health and addictions issues that lead to the homelessness. The other one is the housing. I agree 100%. Our housing stock, um, I just saw the statistic today, the rents in New Brunswick were the highest uh, rates in the rents in the, in the country. So our rental rates are high. Our, we're popular, That's a, we're a victim of our success. People want to live here, why wouldn't you? But we have to get a more complete housing stock and find a strategy so that we get uh, intergenerational housing, affordable housing, and housing for all. Thank you. Thank you all for your responses to that first question. Uh, you've all mentioned housing and ho homelessness uh, in your opening remarks and, and in your answers, and that's a perfect segue into the second question. Uh, and we will start with Drew uh, and go to Kate, Mike, and then Corinne in that order. There have been several recent debates uh, around what role the municipality should play in addressing affordable housing and homelessness. What specific municipal policies do you think are needed? Drew. Well, there's, I believe the city, as I said, can become a property owner. That's something that they're permitted to do. There's also an opportunity if there was some change in some of the municipal, provincial municipal governance legislation, that they could become a developer as well. And I think that that would give us some flexibility, certainly, in then tackling some of the housing. Now, I, I don't disagree. We want to be fiscally uh, prudent, but if we take the role of developer, then we build the housing we want and we make sure the project is uh, not a burden upon the public purse. Uh, it would seem to be that would be the sensible thing to approach it in that fashion. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost that. that. That's about what I've got. Jill, sorry. Thank you, Drew. Kate. Thank you. Well, people are really struggling with housing, finding housing, finding affordable housing. And the City Hall, we've lacked the leadership. Um, to, to, put, to put in place um, to what, it, what needs to be done to help uh, people find housing. We sort of put our heads in the sand and said it's someone else's responsibility, and we cannot do that. These, these people are living in our community. Uh, there's lots of ways that we need to tackle it. Um, one, we need to work with developers to increase the very types of, of housing so that we have single room occupancies and ones and two bedrooms, and then also we have homes that, are, that can accommodate new families that come here with larger families. So different types of housing. We need to have... Uh, we need to hire a housing specialist. We don't have anyone on staff to advise on how it is that we can satisfy the various needs. Someone to work with the developers to incite the type of developments that we know our Fredericton residents need. We don't need more two-bedroom luxury apartments. We need places where people who are in fixed incomes can live. Um, we need to be a leading voice for Fredericton to other levels of government to make sure that, that they know that we want movement on these issues and that we're, we're there at the table. We're, we're, we're convening groups and we're there participating along with them. Um, people experiencing housing are still, uh, people experiencing homelessness, sorry, um, still are people who are, live in our city and we owe these people dignity and we owe them safety and care and we often say it's mental health, it's addiction, sometimes it, it's poverty, sometimes it's socioeconomic issues beyond their control and to me we, it's our responsibility to find projects to, to, to help and assist. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, I take a uh, I've been working this file for 15 years. Uh, this council and me as mayor have done uh, more than any council in Fredericton's history to try to advance the file on this and still it's, it's a big issue. Um, uh, I started the Fredericton's, uh, City Fredericton Affordable Housing Committee because developers were not taking advantage of any government programs to build affordable housing. I spent days and days and evenings working with developers to encourage them and finally they came on board and then they started jumping on board to build affordable housing to the point where there was no money left in the provincial programs. So it was a success. I was then asked to chair the Community Action Group on Homelessness for two years while we developed the Road Home. Uh, to end chronic homelessness. And a lot of great work has come out of that. So uh, we brought the community together to, to put that plan together, and we can do that again. The first action I took as mayor was to call the Mayor's Task Force on, Task Force on Homelessness, which engaged the city more in that. We donated two pieces of land, and it developed, it, out of that came a community effort to create 40 micro units. Four are built, seven are underway, and the rest of the money, a lot of this being diverted to the city motel project. Forty people are going to have affordable housing there. So we've done a lot. I've been actively engaged in this, so I take a bit of offense to say that we haven't had the leadership on it. Uh, 
But as I said, no matter how much we do, the problem still exists. There will always be people that need help. So we do have to get better at uh, developing policies, working with developers to try to encourage other developers to come online to build housing. Thank you, Mike. Corinne, your turn. Yeah. So I would have to say that I haven't seen a lot in the 10 to 15 years um, that there have been committees. So if there's a committee on affordable housing and on homelessness for that long of a period of time, and we have the crises that we've had this winter, and that is going to continue through the summer, then there's something else that needs to be done. Uh, what I would like to see as far as changes go under uh, Bill 44 with the municipal reform would be that there is some autonomy given to the city, to the municipalities in New Brunswick under the natural person's power. And that would allow us to um, have more influence in the type of housing that is built. Uh, it says to foster economic, social, and environmental well-being of its communities. And so we would be able to offer um, a tax relief for developments. We would be able to incentivize developments in that direction. Um, I would love to see CDFs offered in the city. Currently, they're only at the, the provincial level. And, but under the new municipal reform, they could be possible for Fredericton as well. And so if we have um, those under our belt, we would surely be able to move that file forward. And again, just let the uh, support the organizations that know how to do it, and then move forward with creating collaborative efforts so that we can work together and create the type of afford affordable housing that is needed. Thank you, Corinne. That is uh, our second question. Uh, like in a marathon or half marathon, two out of 12 done. So 10 more to go. So hang in there. Question number three. Um, the Fredericton Chamber, we, we should probably expect uh, a, a business question sometime tonight, and, and this is it. Uh, the Chamber is, is a, an award-winning chamber across the country, uh, punches above its belt uh, uh, in, in its category across the country, and, and well-renowned for the work it does in the city. So the, the third question, and we will start with Kate, go to Mike, Corinne, and then Drew in that order. So the question is, how do you think that municipal government can best provide a good environment for businesses and best support development and economic growth? Kate? Sometimes I think the best thing that, uh, that a government can do is sort of get out of the way, um, but not in the sense that they negate any sort of responsibility, but that they provide businesses the opportunity to, to do what they do and to thrive and to be creative and, 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 and I think that we can support them by, by having a bias to yes, so that when they bring creative solutions and creative ideas to us, we, we have this bias towards yes. Um, I also think that working with the development community, there have been struggles with City Hall often. You know, we have a lot of different city departments that interface with different businesses depending on the business. And I would say when developers come, come to City Hall, they, um, they work with, develop, with the planning department, they work with building services, um, but sometimes they don't always know which, you know, they're trying to satisfy everyone. It, the process needs to be more streamlined, so I think that we can have a bias to yes, we can streamline processes, but we can also be in really regular communication with developers and let them know what it is. For instance, we're talking about housing. Let them know what kind of housing um, options that, that we need in our city, and then provide the guidance, whether that be through design guidelines, whether that be through just a, a how-to format so that they don't have to keep going back and forth. We hear from developers all the time that they're creating the developments to the specs that they think are required only to find out they need to redo them. So I think that we can, we can help in that. We can give supports, provide guidelines, streamline the process, be, it just be supportive and also celebrate the businesses in our community. Thank you, Kate. Mike, your turn. Thank you. Good public infrastructure, good roads, streets, sidewalks, uh, urban forest, the things that make people want to come to our city and then support our businesses. Uh, we really, uh, we're, we're good at that, and we can't let our foot off the gas. Uh, that's, that's one of the big selling points. Uh, the, the safe water that our, that our businesses can uh, access, the safe water and sewer systems is not very sexy, but that's the bottom line that works really well. Uh, sidewalk clearing, especially in our business district, is so important. So we're, we're getting better at that, and we're going to have a big focus on it. Uh, tourism and marketing. 
we have a great tourism department. Uh, we, we lead the way in New Brunswick on, on, on uh, some of the efforts we put in. It draws people to our city. Uh, our sports tourism group that myself and two other counselors come up with the idea five or six years ago and it's now embraced, that alone is generating nine to ten million dollars in economic activity to our community. Our tourism, as I said in 2018, had 343 million dollars worth of economic activity. Public safety. Uh, we have to have great, good public safety and we do. Uh, we're a safe community. Uh, residents have to feel safe coming to, uh, to the downtown, to the different cores, and those are the things that the city can do. So infrastructure, uh, tourism, marketing, public safety, and a bias towards yes. I coined that phrase with our startup community about five years ago, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, somebody has a good idea, especially a young startup in our community, we give them a shot, and there's been great five or six great success stories come out of that. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Corinne, your turn. Yeah, first I would say always buy local. Always support your local businesses. Um, and that would be City Hall as a starting place. Uh, parking, progressive parking downtown. Uh, one of the things when I've talked to a lot of the business owners, they say nobody would know how many parking tickets we pay for people. And they're 20 bucks a piece now, or maybe 25. I, I haven't had one. But, but uh, they talk about, you know, kind of have progressive parking where if you go over your parking limit, you only pay a little bit. And then if you go over an hour, you pay a lot sort of thing. Or show a receipt for, for shopping downtown and then have the parking ticket paid. Something as simple as that. Um, sidewalk safety, so people who are visually impaired to, to put a bright yellow line on the outside of sidewalks, cut red tape, not blue ribbons. Um, centralize small and medium-sized businesses issues into one place. Um, certainly have washrooms and cafes outside for um, downtown businesses. Um, create pandemic recovery account. Uh, support uh, businesses with uh, money and services when they need it, for, such as a pandemic. Too many have shut their doors. Support pedestrian-owned districts and business neighborhoods, which I really have seen um, should happen on the north side of the river where we have those wonderful districts and communities and a business diversity charter so um, agricultural center uh, local doesn't get um, overrun by chains etc thank you Corinne Drew well I, I appreciate the question I think I think Mike had a very good one if the city has got a clean downtown good infrastructure well there's the building block for starting a, a business um, that's a fundamental cornerstone. I myself ran a business for about seven years and, and I have to say the struggle of being a single business person is long. There's lots of things that you have to take care of, lots of hats you have to wear. Um, Kate's idea of streamlining things for making business easier is great. I, I think that uh, that in itself might be a very big incentive. We have to make Fredericton attractive uh, if we want to encourage outside investment and we want to bring businesses from abroad. Um, and I think we do a very good job in, in encouraging. Uh, I, I've been noticing that one thing that's been really positive over Fredericton, everyone seems to be saying, I want to live here because I know the city is going somewhere. So for me, that, that, that is a big bonus for any business. They know there's a growing population here. There's going to be more people willing to spend their money, looking for services and all these things. So that success builds upon success. And uh, hopefully um, we can make that, like I said, those infrastructure things are what's needed, I think, to provide that cornerstone. So that's something I would focus on. Thank you for your answers to question number three. Uh, question number four, we will start with Mike to answer and then follow with Corinne, Drew, and Kate in that order. Uh, there's been a lot of public discussion, uh, as you know, about the Performing Arts Centre, the new public pool, Officers Square, and the exhibition grounds. Two parts of the question. The first one is, what is your position on each of these projects? But the next part is, how would you prioritize them? I, uh, a minute and a half on each question? Nope, 90 seconds. Okay, uh, I support them all. <laughs> That's a quick answer to that. The Performing Arts Center was our number one priority uh, for s several reasons, but I'll boil it down to two. One is the fact that it's the heart and soul of our downtown, and it's, it supports so many of our businesses in and, and, and that. It, it's, uh, 
People, not everybody's an athlete. A lot of people aspire to the performing arts. But it's also a piece of public infrastructure. We talked about infrastructure renewal. And the taxpayers and the residents of Fredericton own that. The building's failing. We have to fix it. The Regional Aquatic Center was at, we, we're in the fiscal capacity that we can have two priorities, although the PAC was our number one. The Regional Aquatic Center, we're advancing that one. When the university decided to close, uh, we, we were able to bring that to the table. And a community group is driving it. And we're, we're supporting it. Um, and uh, the Officer Square, that was a unanimous decision by council to move ahead on that to try to um, animate the downtown but still be uh, very respectful to the historical nature of that, uh, that uh, great space. Uh, so I support going through with that. Right now there's indigenous consultations and as long as I'm mayor, we'll take all the time we need with the indigenous partners to, uh, just to, uh, to address that. The, uh, the, that the three? Exhibition grounds. Exhibition grounds. That was my file for 19 years. I, w I was passionate about that there could be a better use for that that would also be uh, revitalize the NBX for their 200 year history. We're moving forward. Expect the news soon. Thank you, Mike. Corinne, your turn. Officer Square, I'd put a stop to it right now um, and see uh, what the people want to do with it. I've already uh, elaborated on that. Um, as far as the pool goes, I do think, of course, that we do need a pool. We have wonderful athletes here. Uh, I support the pool. I, th I do believe, though, that it should be an Olympic-sized pool so that we, if you're talking about sports tourism, then you're talking about training athletes. The Cultural Arts Centre, I hear a lot of different uh, voices on that, that it's not especially uh, unanimous. Many people are concerned about the price and the $45 million uh, that was tagged a year or so ago, um, it's not, it's not going to cut it right now because the costs have gone up for materials so much. And we need lots of buy-ins. So I support uh, a cultural arts center, of course, but I would really be cautious about the price tag of it. The NBX grounds, I think there should be development on it, but I think it should be intergenerational development, and it should be a community, and I would work hard to maintain the integrity of the agricultural component by putting in gardens and creating animal-assisted therapy spaces. Um, it's huge tourism, it's huge business in many of the other cities, and it would just be foolish for us to throw that away when we already have it. It's also an opportunity for technology um, in growing, and that is, of course, where the future of food security is, and we have the space. We would be foolish not to use it. I think that that certainly is what uh, the direction I would take. Thank you, Corinne. Drew. I have been very, initially I was a very big non-supporter of the new Playhouse, but I did have a discussion with Tim Yerksa, and I see its economic benefits, and it provides direct and indirect jobs. I think they have to find a site and start building it. And when they build it, if it's going to be in the price range they're calling for, then they have to think of adding something, perhaps housing, perhaps retail space, perhaps office space, that is going to help defray that cost. There has to be something beyond just a playhouse on the site. There has to be another revenue stream that can help make that more affordable. As to a regional pool, I agree. An Olympic-sized pool is what I think we need. Um, however, I want to see it built in the city of Fredericton, in a neighborhood. I would prefer to see it, I mean, it's attached now to the Grant Harvey. It could just as easily have been attached to the Willie O'Ree or to the Nashua Oxus Middle School. These sites are right in neighborhoods. One of uh, the Willie O'Ree is in a growing area where there would be a neighborhood, more so in the future. Uh, the exhibition grounds, that is one of the things that makes us unique. I think we shouldn't be fooling around with it it is something where it should be. It's in the right place. It's a great location. As for developing the property around it, it has to be for a really good reason. It can't be just more luxury apartments. The officer square, reset. Thank you, Drew. Kate. I think, so. well, these are all very important projects and uh, they all need to be completed and they can be completed. So first of all, uh, with the Performing Arts Center, you know, one in four residents, Fredertonians, go to the Performing Arts Center. They have lots of programming to support folks to be able to afford to come. They have, um, and it's, uh, so it's, it's a vital, it's a vital um, gem in our downtown. It also is, its replacement is just good asset management, which is something that Fredericton prides itself on. And we need to do that because people need to go, be able to go see live performance, and we also require the economic driver in our downtown. Um, as for um, 
as for the pool, we need to get the regional aquatics facility figured out. It's, it's one of the things I'm hearing about most from the voters. There's a very good uh, community-led approach right now that is a regional approach, which I support. And I support the location because I think that it's um, because of its location and proximity to, to the regions to whom we're asking for support. I think that it's needed from both an attraction perspective, but also from a healthy lifestyle perspective. Um, the, uh, with Officer Square, as I've already pointed out, I think that we hit reset on Officer Square. We, we got it wrong, and I was part of the council that voted in support. I was always leery. I was one that stayed behind when people were concerned, and I continue to be concerned, and, and I think that we put it back to a natural, uh, to more of a natural setting. And as for MBX development, it's essential. That is the most uh, critical development that we will see in a generation in our city, and it's so important, especially for housing, for inclusive housing and affordable housing. Thank you, Kate. And that is the last answer to that question. The following question, we will start with Corinne first uh, to answer, and then Drew, Kate, uh, and then Mike. The question, what kind of experience do you have that qualifies you for the job of mayor? If elected, would it be important to try to bring council together as a team? And if so, how would you accomplish this? The, the, the qualities that I have that I can bring to the table as mayor is that I know what is going on in the community and I've worked in the community. I also have um, an understanding of what goes on in City Hall. My dad ran for a council um, when it was a town of Marysville, but I have been brought up with uh, politics my whole life. Also teaching, uh, you know, in sociology, you teach political economy, political science. So. That's, an, that's what I think I can bring, is the type of knowledge and the working in the community that it takes. I don't think you can lead without serving. Uh, as far as bringing the, the council together to work as a team, of course, but I also think that the councils, councillors need to work in their wards. Um, the, we need to be holding council meetings in the wards, town halls, and then um, have them come together so that in council meetings we know what's going on. And I think that um, as far as bringing the idea of, um, I forgot your, the last part of your question. <laughs> how would you accomplish this? Yeah, so, so how I would accomplish it is uh, having the, really having councillors work in their wards, but me work in the wards. Being a mayor is not going to keep me from uh, still working in the gardens with seniors and still uh, working at the shelters and still volunteering and doing the things I do, although I know I won't have as much time to do those things, but uh, work and serve the people, and then the councillors will as well. Thank you, Corinne. Drew. Well, as mayor, I, I feel that personally, I'd be wanting to meet with all our councillors, see what's the issues in their wards, and then set out an action plan to say, okay, these are the issues I've identified in your wards. Um, I'll use a Marysville example. I know I spoke to Steve Hicks. The bridge in Marysville is uh, getting a little raggedy. It needs some provincial help. That, that's one issue that I think once those issues are identified, we can start to collaborate on them. The mayor can say, okay, I know what's going on in this ward. I know what's going on in this ward. I'm hoping that we're going to have a council that's willing to be a little more activist in some of these very important issues that we're trying to tackle. Um, I'm mean, also at Corrine. Okay, so... What was the second part of the question? How did you accomplish this? Okay, as I said, I'd be meeting with the councillors, seeing what the issues were in their the council. We'd say, okay, what's the plan? What can we do? What can we get done in this year? What can we get done in our second year? We have four-year planning horizon. I would personally like to see as much front-loading of our planning in the first year and then try to get the action taken care of in the second, third, and fourth year. I, I am, as I said, a forester by trade. Forestry plans are usually something that you make 5, 20, 25 years, much what Mike is saying, but there has to be an action to it, so we have to keep that in mind. Thank you, Drew. Kate. Thank you. So I have lots of experience. In particular, I have council experience, which I think is really critical, um, particularly for the role of mayor. It, it, it takes a lot to, to learn to be an effective councillor, just the, the legislation alone, but also the operations, the functioning of City Hall, working with staff. I have that experience having been around that table for nine years. Um, I also have community experience. I've worked with, with many organizations, both um, from uh, 
from an administrative position, being the director, working throughout the organization, but also in volunteering with the organization, serving on boards of directors. And I, uh, so you learn a lot when you're with nonprofit. You, you learn how to collaborate with others because it takes many, uh, many people to accomplish goals. You also learn how to stretch a dollar. I always find it funny when we, when we pat ourselves on the back for, for balancing our budget every year at the city. Nonprofit organizations have to balance their budgets all the time. It's just how you operate. It's how you function and do work. And so to me, that is just par for the course. Um, also, I think it's really important that there be a team effort. It's important that the mayor encourage councillors to speak out and represent their, their constituents and to, to let them know that they can do it without letting, making them feel alienated from others. Also, also, though, to encourage to be mentoring them and sharing with them the skills of being a good counselor, how to reach out into the community, how to, how to do you know, public engagement in neighborhood meetings. And there's a lot of mentorship that a mayor can provide. But what's most important is that you sit down with your team and you build a vision for the city. Mike. Thank you. Um, I won't go through my extensive list of community involvement, but the one that was most... Uh, uh, beneficial was my time on the board of Horizon Health and I was chair of the patient care committee and, and met with the doctors and, and uh, on all the issues that are being faced there. That was very beneficial when I decided to run for city council. I've been 15 years as a councillor and I chaired every committee, a deputy mayor for two years and uh, as finance chair I was able to bring in the long-term fiscal plan and our asset management plan um, which uh, really was the bedrock of working with the council and the staff to bring that forward. This put us on a path uh, where we can be resilient enough to consider a couple of big projects. So those were uh, the things in my work career. I'm an engineer. I got into big project management. I'm a mechanical engineer. We get into building factories. That's what brought me back to New Brunswick after I graduated from UNB to build a, a, a fish plant on Graham and Ann Island and all the logistics located uh, around that. And I got it done. So, um, and then I spent uh, years with the New Brunswick Liquor Corporation as vice president and acting president. So I had that level of management uh, experience on the, uh, the vision setting, the goal setting, and hitting targets and, and answering to, uh, to the taxpayers. So I uh, brought that to the council with me. On the teamwork, I agree 100%. We are a team. Uh, the, mayor, uh, the mayor is the, uh, the chair of the board in, in one respect, but it's the, the council that makes the decisions, and together we have to work closely together. I've mentored many of the new councillors, and that's always a challenge, and uh, I'll be up for that the next time around. So. Thank you, Mike. For the next question, we will start with Drew, then Kate, Mike, and then Corinne. What do you see as gaps and barriers to enhance the relationship and collaboration between the City of Fredericton and St. Mary's First Nation? And what is your strategy to move forward in reconciliation? Well, I feel that there's a bit of a lack of respect for that community. And it is, it's disheartening because they are our neighbors. We're their neighbors. Um, they have basically been historically friends of our ancestors for as long as we've been here. So I feel that we have to do more as a city to try to foster a better relationship. We have to try and say, um, what's your opinion? And show that it matters. Take what they want um, and say, we can do that. We can take action on some of these things. The archaeological dig that went on at Officer's Square, uh, uh, I don't know if really it met what the community was looking for. And, and, and perhaps that's what we have to be more proactive, is just say, OK, here we are in the city, and we're building here, and we're building here. What's, what's important to you, St. Mary's? What, what's in the history of this site, in your habitation of this area, what matters? What can we do to make this um, so it, 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 it respects the fact that you have strong ties to this piece of land or ground and uh, that you, uh, you, know, you are our neighbors? Thank you. Kate? St. Mary's is a, they're a key part of our, of our city, of, of our community. Um, and, and they've been gracious enough to, uh, so that we've inhabited it for many, many years. I think the, the fact that the relationship isn't better is, 
is very is unfortunate and I think a lot of it has to do with with approach you know a lot of the relationships and I've witnessed it I've been there and and until very very recently a lot of the relationship with St. Mary's has been very transactional and we've talked you know it's been based on agreements and based on trying to trails and water and pipe and and sewer and you know it, it's been that kind of language as opposed to it just being sort of a, first off just an acknowledgement of how important that they are in our community and how, how significant it is that we have such a vibrant uh, First Nation right within our city limits that contributes so much culturally to our city, economically contributes so much to our city. So in my mind first it's just an acknowledgement of that all of the time for us to be saying it all of the time and also at the very least I would like to see at the beginning of all of our council meetings for us to acknowledge that we're in traditional grounds of the West Sequoia. So, so for me, I think that first it, it's, it's an approach, it's an acknowledgement. It is also, um, and then it is the building of the friendship and the fostering of the relationship and not, and so it needs to be more than just, than just showing up and, and having, you know, uh, on special occasions, I think it needs to be reaching out on a regular basis for conversations and, and for shared opportunities and just always to be keeping the St. Mary's community top of mind because they, they were here first. Thank you, Kate. Mike. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Kate. Uh, we, uh, we had many uh, transactional uh, uh, interactions with St. Mary's, and sometimes we got bogged down by that. L complex land deals that we're working on, uh, contracts for uh, public safety, water and sewer, and sometimes that sucked all the air out of the room. And uh, we have to step back, and we have. We, uh, we have an, a dedicated position now at City Hall, and we're funding that position to be our... Uh, our uh, indigenous uh, liaison person uh, so that we can learn better. And as I talked to Chief Polchies just the other day, I said, this is a learning process. It's not for you to learn, it's for us to learn. And every day we're, we're, our eyes are opening more about how we must respect and, and how we do respect and how we can go forward in a, in a, in a series of peace and friendship agreements. So we're going to get there because it's too critical not to. Um, the... Um, the, the federal government issued a smart city challenge a year, two years ago, which we uh, applied for, and I insisted that St. Mary's be part of that. And together, we put an application in, and we were one of the 10 finalists in Canada on a smart city initiative, working with our partners at St. Mary's. Um, and we didn't get to the, the final three, but that's okay. That broke down a lot of barriers and, and mistrust. So I f saw that was a real positive thing. It was the right thing to do. But those are ways that we have to learn to reach out and embrace. And... Uh, as mayor, I'm committed to that. So that's a, um, as I say, every day we learn more and we're going to get better at it. Thank you, Mike. Final candidate, Corinne, on that question. Yes, I think the gap is actually trust. Uh, there's no reason for anyone at St. Mary's or an Indigenous person to trust the city or any of us um, when we disregard what, they, what their culture is. I know that from the people that I speak to and the friends that I have, it's, it, they, it's neat about more than just taking a position or having um, the kind of the token acknowledgement done, which they hear so many times. And it is about learning from them, um, actively seeking to learn ourselves, but also to give them a seat at the table so that there are 12 councillors, one mayor, and one Indigenous person representing um, the Indigenous people of Fredericton, whether that comes from St. Mary's or whether it comes from a broader initiative. Now, that is completely outside of anything that has been done or suggested, and I do believe that is something that has to be done. Uh, it's the only way to be inclusive and to include them in, in what is happening at City Hall. With the Peace and Friendship Alliance, there's uh, so much that is happening that City Hall should be a part of, so... It's the blanket exercises, it's the art that was done along the riverbank, uh, everything that happens with the programs that take place, whether it's for restorative justice, alternatives to violence, to, to not offer them for, from City Hall, but to be supportive. Thank you. That brings an end to the first uh, six questions of the evening. We're going to move into the rapid-fire uh, session of the debate. Uh, you will have just 60 seconds. Uh, that's what my notes say, rapid-fire, 60 seconds for uh, answering each question. Uh, for the first question of this second segment, we'll start with Kate, Mike, Corinne, and Drew. The first question, as you know, the provincial government uh, has undertaken uh, municipal reform consultations throughout the province. What local government changes do you hope to see from these consultations? I um, 
So I'm really glad that this municipal reform is taking place. There's about three, I think there's 350 municipal units, um, uh, some incorporated, some not uh, uh, in the province. And it's just too many for a province our size. And it, I think it keeps us from working together the way that we need to to advance our province. So I would like to see um, a lot more regional cooperation on, on some large projects. And I think that that needs to be done probably uh, through looking at various ways to, to change the incorporation of some of these communities. There are about 30% of, of, uh, of residents in New Brunswick that don't, that don't have representation, municipal representation, so a way to somehow capture that. Uh, land use planning, I think we can do, I'm hoping that there's some land use planning um, that, that comes out of this better land use planning because what we see right now are, are cities and then we have sort of ribbon communities and, and unincorporated areas and so we're not effectively using our land and, and, uh, and just I think I would just like to see better sharing amongst, amongst uh, the region. Thank you, Kate. Mike. Fair taxation. Uh, we have to get better at that. Only eight cents of every tax dollar comes to a municipality. And uh, so we have to be able to break down those barriers. Uh, the, the, uh, New Brunswick is now eight cities. Uh, they say it's a rural province, but it's really 85% um, of the population of New Brunswick lives within a 50 kilometer uh, radius of a downtown of one of our eight cities. So those have to be taken into account. Regional cooperation, absolutely. The RSC uh, system doesn't work quite well. It does in some parts of the province, but we have to get better at that. I know that's a big goal of the province to have everybody have a vote. Uh, and how that shapes out onto a bigger picture, I'm not sure uh, yet. I, I'm, being, I, I'm advising the province on a lot of issues from my uh, years of experience. I've been being asked, so I feed them uh, some info, my goals. Um, we have to have the tools. Uh, legislation has to change to let us have the tools to do more of the things we need to do. Land planning, um, incenting uh, developers, those kind of things. We have no power to do that, so it's got to change. Thank you, Mike. Corinne, over to you. Yeah, um, I think that uh, if we could have more autonomy, certainly we would be able to do more incentivizing for health care for uh, our doctors to come to the city, and also that we would be able to have um, grants and assistance for businesses and nonprofit organizations. Also, there would be incentives for heritage so that we could do upgrades and um, assistance and make that as a cl climate adaptation. So I would see that the, the region, the that the municipalities get together and share what it is that are concerns and then the, that we be, have the autonomy to put those um, in place. Certainly that there is the role that the municipalities have to take now because the province has backed away from it and withdrawn funding. And so if we have to do it, then we need to have the legislation to proceed and to be able to do it properly and effectively. And, uh, work with the organizations and the businesses that do what they do. Thank you, Corinne. Drew. Well, when you were speaking of this, I just, first thing that came to my mind was amalgamation. So I know that they want to make less municipalities. Um, I, as, as if I was elected mayor of the city of Fredericton, I certainly would be all in favor of the province making New Maryland part of Fredericton. I think that would be a great addition to Fredericton. Uh, certainly once we have to extend the water and sewer out to them because they have a aquifer that's drying up. However, my concern with this is that if we're going to make smaller regions, say like Keswick Ridge, become part of Fredericton, uh, what are we going to provide for services out to Keswick Ridge for their, their taxes are going to go up? And what exactly in this plan is going to provide the services that would justify that increase in taxes? Um, so I, I, I think it's great that this the province is going to try to make things, representation is very important, so you have to have that, but I'm not sure about the rest of it. Thank you. For the next question, we will start with Mike and then Corinne, Drew, and Kate. What specific actions can the municipal government make to attract and retain more newcomers? We have to work with the uh, universities. They're the, uh, the portal for many of the newcomers that are coming to our community. Um, I've been engaged with the, the president. I was on the board. Um, they're uh, really trying to refine their efforts to, uh, to be more focused. Uh, and uh, once, once uh, students are here, we, uh, we have to really work hard through the different groups to, uh, to um, ingrain them into the community so that they don't want to leave. Uh, the new, uh, the new uh, programs have a graduates that can work here, so those are very important, the federal government program. Uh, we have to get uh, at the city. 
uh, along with our partner Ignite Fredericton that, uh, uh, that runs our immigration uh, initiatives. Uh, we have a uh, local immigration partnership with four committees that are focused on trying to break down the barriers for newcomers here so that they can feel included, uh, so that uh, the city hall reflects them. The other one is the Lost Votes campaign. We have uh, thousands of uh, people that are permanent residents that can't vote, and we've got to change that. Corinne, your turn. Yeah, certainly uh, the students that I talk with, they, they do want to stay in Fredericton, but they can't stay in Fredericton because they can't afford housing, and they can't get, get jobs that would allow them to pay any type of a, a rent. And, of course, there's no rent control, so the rents keep going up. So yeah, they would like to stay, but they can't. So to attract and retain newcomers, um, when I work with the uh, newcomers that are at the Salvation Army Garden and they come and volunteer, uh, food security is huge. Uh, although the, the overall rate of the food bank usage has escalated uh, over 100%, all the food banks, uh, it is new to Fredericton that is really struggling to have food security. So we need to look at that. Also adopt a no, a no wrong door policy, which is to coordinate um, all of the agencies so that whatever agency is approached, the person is helped. And City Hall can lead and share in that approach itself. Um, and again, be the leader for that type of an initiative. Thank you. Drew. Could I have the question again there, Jill, just to make sure? What specific actions can the municipal government make to attract and retain more newcomers? Okay. Well, housing is, the, the short answer is you've got to have some place to live, and it has to be affordable. Um, likewise, we've got to have businesses which can provide the job opportunities that allow uh, newly arrived immigrants and students who are looking to settle here the ability to pay their bills. Um, one of my neighbors, interestingly enough, is um, from India, and, and she has now found a job here, but she's living in a single room occupancy place, and uh, she has no pl she's been there two years. She has no plan on leaving because basically that's all she can afford. Even though she has found what appears to be a very good job, it's not providing, um, with our housing market the way it is, it just doesn't seem to provide, uh, it's a real hindrance for uh, are, are, are newly arrived and the people who want to settle here, not to mention the residents themselves. But. Thank you, Drew. Kate, your turn. Yes, well, we need immigration for growth and for diversity. And uh, probably, and the most important thing we need to be able to do is to provide housing. And in order to provide housing, we need to ensure that there are different types of housing that are available to newcomers when they, when they arrive. Because sometimes they're single in couples, sometimes they come with large families, and it's very challenging for them to find affordable, safe housing. Um, we need to improve our transit system so that newcomers have a way to get around the city when they, when they arrive. And we need, to, we need to really be looking at, the, at their transit schedule when we need to be really, really committed to, to making the sorts of changes to make it usable for everyone. We need to build, uh, to support the organizations that are delivering uh, the retention programs uh, and, and training programs. We need to build social cohesion through inclusive recreational program, uh, programming and deliver programming that's, uh, that, is, that is attractive to newcomers, but also that's embraceive and welcoming. And, but most of all, we need a city hall uh, to, to take the lead and, and um, and to ensure that diversity is, is welcome at City Hall, that it's embraced at City Hall, and that most of all it's included in our decision making. Thank you, Kate. For the next question, we will start uh, for answers with Corinne, Drew, Kate, and then Mike. How should the City of Fredericton balance development with heritage preservation? Uh, well, I think that the development that we're seeing, we're getting a lot of pop-up developments and those are just tearing down heritage buildings and then putting up something new. There doesn't seem to be um, a plan for those, although there is the Imagine Fredericton plan, and I haven't seen how those actually coordinate. It is incredibly important to keep our heritage buildings, uh, unless they're in such dire straits that it's going to cost a fortune to, to keep them. Uh, they need to be uh, retrofitted and restored and used for affordable housing or for businesses, for nonprofit organizations, uh, whatever it is, whatever use we can best make of them. But the balance would have to come from knowing what is going to be spent in new developments versus in restoring developments uh, or restoring uh, heritage houses. And you, it does have to be weighed, but we can't just keep knocking everything down because it just will not come back. Drew? 
Interestingly, the heritage of the downtown of Fredericton has changed quite a bit since I've been here. King and Queen Street has, has seen some developments that I've sort of said, well, couldn't something of that have been saved? Couldn't some not different approach been taken? Um, I think what the city has to do is, is say, okay, we want a certain core of our heritage to be kept and we are willing to help. Um, I mean, people in the downtown, the king and the queen, they're paying very high property taxes. And if they're in an old building which needs retrofitting or renovation, the city should be willing to say, okay, we can help with that. In exchange for that, we want this basically to be a part of our, 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 our downtown, and it will remain a part of our downtown. In exchange for that, we'll be willing to help you out. Uh, and I think we have to be careful about just allowing a developer to come and tear down and build. Thank you. Kate. Yes, well, I'm scared that we're losing uh, our built heritage and, um, you know, heritage buildings are being, are being demolished. There have been quite a few just within the, in the last couple of years in the downtown. And when they're allowed to be demolished, we're losing part of our history. And we're allowing it under the guise that they're in such horrible condition that it's not, that they're not worth saving, that it's too, too costly to renovate. But I think that we sort of need to change the conversation on that and instead be, you know, be promoting the fact that by retrofitting, by restoring, by renovating these buildings and revitalizing them, we're act, they're actually increasing their value and the, and the end product has much more worth than a new, than a new design building. I think of the Picaroons Roundhouse. That's, you know, that so easily could have been demolished, but instead we had a local business person who had a vision for that building, and we look at it now. It was a beautiful retrofit, a beautiful revitalization. It's a communal space where people go and congregate and enjoy nature and enjoy each other and that is because of the heritage we can make it easier we can build more design guidelines into our heritage guidelines and we can promote uh, the benefits of, of heritage buildings thank Mike thank you first these are problems that a growing city has and uh, we have to we have to catch up to it um, we're bringing forward a, a new heritage bylaw in the sometime uh, in, with the new council that'll uh, hopefully close some of the gaps that are there that allow things to happen that really council doesn't have the teeth to stop right now. So that's important. Um, we have to incent the redevelopment of some heritage properties. It's extremely expensive uh, to redevelop. Yes, they have great value when they're done, but a lot of developers uh, shy away from, from the cost. We have to find a way to do that. I wish we could work with the provincial and federal governments to get some tax incentives to do that. Maybe that's a possibility. The, um, the um, St. Mary's Ferry area was a historic area down St. Mary's Jaffrey Street. A few years ago, we asked the community if we could designate that as a, a heritage area, and they, re, they uh, declined it. So we have to get better at educating the community of why some of these bylaws would be good for the protection of that. Um, so uh, I think but bringing the heritage bylaw forward uh, will give us a better idea of how to move forward in the next few years. Thank you, Mike. For the next question, we will start with Drew, Kate, Mike, and then Corinne. Is it a priority to increase public transit service in the city? If so, what areas should receive priority? And should the King's Place bus hub be moved? 60 seconds. I'm a frequent, up until February of this year, user of the transit system. And I think basically it's great to have a south side hub. We could probably use a north side hub. Talking to the drivers, they say that we should have some north to north and south to south routes. I believe that we can expand, uh, at least get a partial service on Sunday, and I think that's very important because it helps with our economy, it gets people to work, it allows senior citizens to get out about in the better weather and to do their other affairs. So I think um, overall we have a wheelchair accessible buses, which are, it's great, and I'd love to see that um, be promoted more and that our stops and our infrastructure reflect that uh, need now because we're going to have people who will want to be able to get on the bus and they'll have a wheelchair but do we have a stop for them to actually get to to get onto the bus so uh, my belief is we have to uh, keep working with the system and uh, that's it sorry yeah. well, 
We need to improve our transit system because we need to be able to help people get around, get to work, and we need to, and it's also good for the environment. And we just need to be dedicated and committed to doing that and be creative in how we find those solutions. Some simple things we can do is we have to get the transit back to pre-pandemic levels. We need to look at the transit schedule. It's very much premised on this traditional work week with Saturday errand running. We need to build a schedule that's more reflective of, of how people currently live. Uh, to do that, we know that there is expense and it's sort of a chicken egg. You need more people for more routes, and, but you need more routes to get more people. I think we just need to, to bite the bullet. A, a way to generate some revenue would to be to do more group purchasing the way that we have bus passes for students. Perhaps we provide bus passes for certain workforces that use the bus. That might be a good way to incentivize. And as far as a King Street hub, I'm all, I've always been all for um, the city center plan, which calls for that. But I think a north side, building a north side hub is actually more important so that people on the north side can more easily get around. That would be my priority. Thank you, Kate. Mike. Transit is an essential service and it's an extremely expensive service. So that's the dilemma. It's 60% subsidized in uh, more than that by the taxpayers. So, uh, but it's essential for the people that need it. And really, there's still only the four to five percent of the people that will use the bus. So, uh, just adding more doesn't necessarily more people are going to use it. What we need is density. We need more density along some of our core areas so that more people can use the bus because it's right there. And that help fund that'll help fund more improvements. We're going to trial an on-demand bus service this year. I think it'll maybe be in the Silverwood area. A lot of cities have moved on-demand busing, and it's been very successful. So, if if successful else, elsewhere, it'll work here. And uh, that could really, really change the way we look at transit. Um, the, um, the, the King Street Hub, we're looking at relocating that potentially to the other side of the, uh, of the, of the, the mall and uh, to improve it. The North Side Hub is absolutely essential, uh, but we're not there yet. We need more revenues out of, to drive uh, the system for the people that use it to make those improvements. Thank you. Correct. Yes, the transit system certainly it should be changed up. Uh, students can't get to the university on time because it runs so, so infrequently. So they come very late to a class or they uh, come very early to a class, one or the other. And the fact that there is no Sunday bus, certainly there has to be Sunday bus. It's not just for students, but Sunday's the day a lot of people want to go shopping. When people stop using a, 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 the bus service, they just don't necessarily go back. They've found something that works better. So you don't want to lose anybody else. And we've lost some just because of taking out bus stops. I know a complaint, uh, certainly a complaint when it happened was when the bus stop was taken out in front of stepping stones and MCAPs, which I still don't understand. It's for seniors and for indigenous people, or sorry, for new to Fredericton people. And so why would you move a, a bus stop that was used regularly? Certainly scheduling where the bus stops are and also the comfort of the buses um, when bus drivers say that they're very hot in the summertime, people won't use them. Thank you, Corinne. And thank you, candidates, for those answers. For the next round, we'll start with Kate, Mike, Corinne, and Drew. What type of environmental sustainability initiatives would you initiate or support to keep our city green? Kate, you're yes, first. Sorry. OK. There. There are so many. Um, so, it's, so keeping our city green is essential because of the city that we are. We're at university, we're a smart town, we know that it's the right thing to do and we have the people here to help us do it. We have the knowledge around, around the city to help us uh, to make those choices. Some things that I would do, um, I think that we need to have a green vision overall um, in, in our decision making. Recently, uh, the, that has been put into corporate services at City Hall, which is good because it takes it out of engineering and it looks, it's a, whole, it's a holistic approach, which is what's required. Moving from, from mitigation to adaptation has been very important uh, for the city. Having, encouraging more active, uh, light, more active transportation is very important for the city so that we're not emitting so much gas. Um, we have a lot of plans and strategies in place, but we need to, I, I think, feel, people feel quite disconnected to those plans and strategies and we need to make more evidence some of the some of the actions that people can take on a daily basis to to plan for a green household and to be prepared um, to, to adapt to any to any climate crisis that may come our way Mike community energy emissions plan we just are about to launch that that's I referenced that in my opening talk about that uh, we're, we're looking to drive our uh, emissions citywide emissions uh, down by 80% by the year 2020 50 and we're going to get there. 
Uh, I'd like, we talked about municipal reform. We're the only province, and I mentioned it in the, in the country, that doesn't let us incent residential homeowners to do solar heating projects. Halifax has a great program called Solar City. I'd like to adopt that here where the city borrows money, uh, pays for the installation, the taxpayer pays back through a voluntary payment through, uh, every year through their tax payment. And that could really help drive down emissions. Um, trees, parks, park, and, and green space. We have 138 uh, green space parks in our city, and we have a 63% tree canopy. Our growth strategy calls for more of all of that. Our trees are a $100 million living asset in our city, and we have to up that, uh, and we're going to put a lot of focus in, uh, in that over the coming years to, uh, to, drive the, uh, to drive down gases by more trees and green space. Thanks. Thank you. Corinne. Yeah, I think that um, some of the things that we can look at is for, is for short term and certainly long term. And so in the short term, I think it is uh, really beneficial to immediately adapt a cr uh, crisis, climate crisis plan. It has been um, presented to City Hall or sent to City Hall and it was neglected. So the, the ways in which to make your city green is to do everything you can to, to capture carbon. So that is planting more trees al along the riverbanks, not developing along the riverbanks. Um, making sure that you have a horticultural um, spaces within the city, that you have lots of green spaces. All of the places where the city mows, man, they could save a fortune just by planting those with native plants and flowers, which would increase the carbon capture capacity. Also, um, moving, uh, encouraging transit that is e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, walking, skateboarding, getting around in any other way. Thank you. Drew. Well, the short answer to this question would be elect a forester for mayor. But um, I think, unfortunately, we have a, a very, uh, the city has a very, not to pick on engineers, but a very engineering viewpoint of everything. It's very this and that, and oh, trees are an overburden, just remove them. And okay, well, we're, we're putting in a sidewalk and that little bit of grass where we could be using for alternate plantings or something like that, just put another wider sidewalk there, as they did on Needham Street, as they've done in other places. I think they have to stop thinking that way. Mowing a ton of grass is no great boon to anybody. Figure out some way of making them less energy intensive. I, I, it always staggers me the amount of money we spend in the city on just mowing the lawn. So why not we put more effort setting up our forest, having a plan for the forest, and protecting the forest for God's sake so we don't cut it down when someone says, oh, well, I gotta make the sidewalk wider, let's nail all these trees and go on. Thank you. We're coming up to our last question before we proceed to closing statements. Uh, for this last question, we will start with Mike for answers and then Corinne, Drew, and Kate to wrap up. The last question uh, of the evening, do you believe a systemic racism exists in the Fredericton community? As mayor, what will your strategy be to protect vulnerable and racialized communities? Systemic racism does exist in Fredericton. Uh, we, we've experienced it. We see it. Uh, there was a recent uh, init, uh, uh, broadcast of uh, an issue in Dune Street. Um, when I heard about that, I went over and met with the residents, and they, uh, they, they all spoke to me, and it was really eye-opening about some of the things that we don't understand we, we're, we're, it, we're, it's invisible to us from our privileged position, so we have to get better than that. Our policing department is really reaching out to try to break down some of those barriers, so that's something we've got to do. The Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the leaders of that are working with our police force. We're going to get out to the community too in the, in, early in the summer with a whole new engagement process about how to, just not around systemic racism, but about marginalized people in our community, whether it's race, gender, uh, age, uh, physical ability, and we're going to try to really understand and, and bring people together to develop a, um, a cohesive community plan to address this as we walk together to solve it. So it'll, it'll always be there, but we can never give up on it. Thanks. Thank you. Corinne. I think, of course, there's been systemic racism, and uh, I see it every day again because I teach, and international students, um, they have horrible stories to tell. Um, everything from getting stopped in grocery stores and having to empty bags, um, being, uh, you know, watched as they go everywhere. And then the Dune Street was just uh, something that's always happened there, but it just got escalated, and so the media picked up on it. But it's been going on. And so the ways in which I would that I would encourage racism to, re to reduce racism is 
to have um, communities built so that they are multicultural and that we share the same spaces, we share stories, we share language and feasts and um, get to know each other. And when you get to know people, then you realize how much alike we all are. And it's a, it just is a way of opening up our eyes to see that everybody's the same. Thank you. Drew. Well, systemic racism is just a byproduct, unfortunately, of our colonial past. We have a Indian reserve, which was set because we wanted to have those people in a specific, specific place. Unfortunately, with some of the public housing strategies or the social housing strategies, they did the same thing. They created little ghettos. And that's not right. We've got to be able to say, hey, you're our neighbor. We want you to live next to us. We don't want you to be basically stuck in a corner somewhere because, well, we just don't want to see you. So I, I think our approach has to be, we're neighbors. We want to make this work. We've had problems. We certainly don't want to continue with them. We want people to be respected and feel that they're valued as a part of our community. Our community can only be as strong as, as the most marginalized are. If we don't treat them well, then we're not doing anything really to advance Fredericton as a place that's worthy of uh, our efforts. Thank you. Kate. Yes, systemic racism definitely exists in Fredericton. And we've, we've known this for a long time, um, but we just haven't been actively listening when, when people have been telling us and, and when it's been demonstrated, we've, we've looked away. And, and we, we can't do that any longer because it has been very much brought to the forefront across New Brunswick, across North America, and in our very own city. The, working in the community, I've had the benefit of, um, of, of being aware of this, uh, being supportive, supporting the organizations that, that try to help racialized groups. Um, it, the, the additional help was, was required certainly during the pandemic when all vulnerable groups were even further marginalized for various reasons. We need to be intentional in our response. We need to be intentionally sensitive. It isn't enough for us to any longer say, we, we think we're being kind, we think we're being generous. We need to be very intentional in that. We need to intentionally reach out and create opportunities where we can come together and get to know each other so that we can respect each other. We need to try to see through others' eyes and understand their experience. Thank you, Kate. That was the last of the questions. The last portion now of the evening, uh, as mentioned uh, at the outset, closing statements from each candidate. They will ha each have two minutes uh, for their closing remarks. Uh, we will start with uh, Corinne and then go proceed to Drew, Kate and Mike. So Corinne, your two minutes. Hi, I'm so glad that we've been able to have this debate and certainly um, some of the things that I would encourage uh, voters to think about is how are the platforms different? Uh, what is the end result going to be when the person gets in, whoever you vote in? Uh, what is going to happen to the NVX grounds? What will, the, will, there, will there be a pool? Will there be a cultural arts center? But also what will happen to the rest of the city? Um, how much money is going to high-end projects and not uh, serving the rest of the city, uh, the people in the city? Um, what do we think about um, the mayor that goes in as far as being able to trust the person. Not in that they're dishonest, but that in that are they going to be able to get the things done that they say they're going to do. To do? Uh, there's all kinds of questions that I think need to be asked about the person who's voted in as mayor. I believe that I am a different voice. I don't think that experience in City Hall necessarily makes the best mayor or counselor. Um, you have to go sometime, <laughs> and we know that experience, if, if it was experience that kept you there, nobody would ever change off. So I value the experience of the other candidates. I think people have done good jobs um, while they've been there, and then they get to a point where uh, we need new voices. We need new faces. We need new ideas. And especially when the people in the community have been saying that they have not been listened to and that their voices have been disregarded. They feel that the projects that are being done are projects that are vanity projects or projects that are not servicing most of the people. They're afraid. They're afraid of tax dollars. They're afraid of their assessments going up. They're afraid of what's coming next. What will happen to Officer Square? What will happen to NBX? What will happen to the market? And what will happen to the north side? Frederick, you have been provided the choice of four excellent candidates for mayor. 
some of whom are your friends or family, I would encourage you to think about your neighbors when you go to vote. What city do you want to see in four years and live in? One where we can live with some dignity or one which continues to ignore the plight of our neighbors? Action is the answer. Tangible results. <laughs> neighbors being helped by neighbors. Neighborhoods becoming greener and better to visit or live in. If elected mayor, these are my goals, and I will work for them until they come to fruition. Thank you for your consideration. Kate. Thank you, Jill. Well, first off, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Chamber of Commerce and to your members for hosting this event. It's been wonderful to have this opportunity to, to discuss and dialogue with the other candidates. So I think we're all here tonight because we want to lead this city. And Fredericton is a beautiful, fortunate city, uh, but increasingly we're seeing the challenges that come with a growing city. And growth is so positive for so many reasons, but we have to be able to support that growth through housing for all, for housing for every person in our city, as well as for access to care and to amenities that keep us healthy, like doctors and accessible, inclusive recreational facilities. We have to put mechanisms in place to support businesses. We have to be vocal with developers in, in stating kinds of development that we need to help us fulfill our, our vision to house everyone. To do all of this takes active leadership. We can't rest on our laurels. We have to be intentional in setting out what we want for our city and putting in the work to get there. We need to actively foster relationships with other levels of government, not just write letters and send staff, we need to support the nonprofit sector who deliver programming to our residents and listen to the people who elect us to ensure we're in line with their needs and in line with the desires for our city. Fredericton is changing and so must the style of leadership at City Hall. We need a new voice. I believe that the role of mayor is not to sit back but to lead, to lead council and to lead the whole city. If you want forward-thinking change from someone who has experience to get the job done, then I'm asking for your support on May 10th. Thank you, Kate. Mike, last remarks. Thank you. Tonight, we've heard from all four contestants, and I trust you conclude that my leadership, vision, and experience is what is required to lead Fredericton as we bounce back from COVID, to expand on our wonderful successes, and to tackle the challenges before us. No one at City Hall is as committed to fiscal management as I am. And no one at City Hall has the battle-tested experience as I on the homeless and affordable housing files. This is an issue with no end. There will always be those in need. But I've brought the community together twice before to develop solutions, and I'll do it again. We will work, in fact, I already am, on charting a new way forward on municipal reform. The province needs seasoned, experienced leaders to lend advice, to guide the legislation, and then once done, to implement it. I look forward to these challenges. It's in my DNA to do so. We must and are focused on growing our population, especially through immigration. We need the workers. We need the investors. We need people to create more business opportunities and wealth for all of our residents. My involvement in and continued leadership on these files will be critical. We have several large projects to complete, and complete them we will. Never give up, never say never. I also wish to say, let's all take a deep breath and not be so hard on ourselves. This is a prosperous, green, growing, and caring city. We have challenges, and yes, we must work, we have a lot of work to do, but at the end of the day, we have so much to celebrate here in Fredericton. We shine on the national and international stage on many fronts. Take a moment to give thanks. And I'll close by simply saying that being your mayor is the greatest honor of my life. I love every day, and I love every challenge and I kindly ask for your vote on May 10th to return my leadership, vision, and experience to City Hall. Thank you, Fredericton, and thank you to the Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings an end to tonight's uh, broadcast. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and thank you to the four candidates for uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas leading up to the elections on May 10th. We do invite you to go out in droves and select your councillors and uh, mayor. Uh, and I invite now the CEO of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, Krista Ross, to wrap up the, this evening.
That brings us to the conclusion of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce 2021 mayoral debate. Thank you once again to the candidates for participating. We wish you the best of luck for the rest of your campaign. We appreciate your candor. We appreciate your willingness to serve your community. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Gilles Alain. He did a great job as our host this evening. And I want to encourage all of you to visit the Chamber's website next week. We're going to post the responses received from council and mayoral candidates to our questions that count. They cover seven areas that focus on business issues, which our members have told us are very important to them. I'd also like to say a special thanks to Rogers TV for hosting us tonight and their continued collaboration. And of course, to all of you, the viewers, who have taken the time to become more informed ahead of the vote. Finally, please be sure and get out and vote on or before May 10th. Thanks again for watching and stay safe.